If you now please turn in our Bibles to the book of First Samuel, the 17th chapter, page 338 in your Schofield Bible. First Samuel chapter 17, beginning with verse 33 and reading through verse 40. This passage is taken from David's encounter with the giant Goliath. We'll read responsively these verses, verses 33 through 40 of the 17th chapter of 1 Samuel. Let's stand, all of us standing together for the reading of this good passage. And Saul said to David, Thou art not able to go against this Philistine to fight with him. Thou art but a youth, and he a man of war from his youth. And David said unto Saul, Thy servant kept his father's sheep, and there came a lion and a bear, and took a lamb out of the flock. And I went out after him, and smote him, and delivered him out of his mouth. And when he arose against me, I caught him by his beard, and smote him, and slew him. My servant slew both the lion and the bear, and this uncircumcised Philistine shall be as one of them, See, he hath defied the armies of the living God. David said, Moreover, the Lord that delivered me out of the paw of the lion, and out of the paw of the bear, he will deliver me out of the hand of this Philistine. And Saul said unto David, Go, and the Lord be with thee. And Saul armed David with his armor, and he put an helmet of brass upon his head. Also he armed him with a coat of mail. And David girded his sword upon his armor, and he essayed to go, for he had not proved it. And David said unto Saul, I cannot go with these, for I have not proved them. And David put them off him. And he took his staff in his hand, and chose him five smooth stones out of the brook, and put them in a shepherd's bag, which he had, even in a scrip. And his sling was in his hand, and he drew near to the Philistine. And let's pray. Father, bless now, we pray, that this hour might hold all for us that you would have us to have in the way of the preaching of thy word and speaking to our hearts meeting our needs, the swift power of our preacher, and thus we pray and anoint our hearing, our ears, that we might truly hear with our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. Then you sure mess up this microphone. You're up here. Over on. Uh, I shouldn't say that. She runs this church from that Morgan bench over there. And uh, tonight I want to talk to you on the subject, I cannot go with these, for I have not proved them. Words that young David spoke to Saul and the leaders of Israel when he had Saul's armor placed on him. And they thought that maybe... If he had Saul's armor, he could have a better, better chance against Goliath. But David said, these don't fit me. No way I can wear this. He said, by the way, I've not proved them. He said, i got, I got a slingshot I know how to use. I'll, I'll prove that. So all proved. I know it works. And he said, okay. He so chose five smooth stones. And I'm often kidding to say this, <laughs> but he said, why did you choose five smooth stones? Well, the honest truth is true. Goliath had four brothers, and David said, I may have to take care of all the family while I'm at it, and so I'll just get me five stones. But David said, I am. This is proved. I don't have to experiment. In Saul's armor, I may have to experiment, but not uh, not with a slingshot. I proved that. I know I can handle myself with a slingshot. That's all I need. All I had was a slingshot and my own hands when I killed the bear. All I had was a slingshot and my own hands when I killed the lion. If I can kill a bear and kill a lion without this armor, I did sure can take care of uh, of uh, Mr. Goliath, and uh, and uh, no use in trying to take something new on. I'm really going to help you tonight if you listen to me as we use this as our text. I cannot go with these, for I have not proved them. 
Our Heavenly Father, bless, I pray, our message and our listening tonight, that we may be edified, strengthened, and, and, and taught, and reminded, and exhorted, and yes, even rebuked. In Jesus' name, amen. Did you ever wonder what the churches were like that Brother Hiles pastored before he came to the First Baptist Church of Hammond? Did you ever wonder what the churches were like when I pastored small churches in the edge of town? I can tell you, they were like this. Like this. People that had been in the Grange Hall Baptist Church of Marshall, Texas, 33 years ago, come to First Baptist Church of Hammond, and they say, Preacher, it's the same thing except bigger. Same thing except bigger. You know why? Because I found what works. Don't need anything else. I found what works. This old mixed-up society of ours always changing. Got to find something else. Not me, buddy. I want to find what works, and that'll be okay with me. I don't need anything else. That was the case with David. The Philistines were an old and powerful enemy of Israel. They often invaded the land, leaving ruin and desolation as they left. Now here's a new <laughs> invasion. <laughs> Saul calls Israel to arms. The two armies pitched their tents on either side of the valley of Elah, E-L-A-H. The Philistines are on the north side of that valley, and the and Israel, the armies of Israel, are on the south side of that valley. And there they prepare for an immense confrontation on either side of the Valley of Elah, the Valley of Elah was about 15 miles north of the city of Jerusalem. Suddenly, it stands up from the armies of the Philistines, a big giant, about 9 to 10 feet tall. I think the nearest, uh, would, uh, the nearest uh, estimate would be 9 feet 9 inches tall. And um, he comes, stands up before the armies of Israel, and he says... Let's settle this battle in an easier way. He said to Israel, You choose yourself a captain. I'll represent the Philistines and let your captain represent Israel. And we will do personal combat with each other. And if, uh, if, if I win, then the Israelites will be servants of the Philistines. If I lose, then the Philistines will be servants of of the Israelites. But good night, this fellow was nine feet nine inches tall. He was a giant of a fellow, strong, and he put fear into the hearts of God's people. There was nobody to volunteer. There was no captain to be raised. A little boy named David, who was a shepherd lad, had some brothers in the armed forces. No, not the Navy, the armed forces. And they had some brothers in the armed forces. <laughs> and <laughs> these uh, brothers were, were a part of the army that was camped on the south side of the valley of Elah, preparing them for battle. David's father, Jesse, sent him to battle and took some, sent David uh, with David <laughs> some <laughs> food and victuals for his brothers in the army. A care package, something like that. Like you'd send a, a box of cookies or something to someone in the service or someone away in college. Uh, Jesse said to David, now son, you go up there and take, uh, and take this and, uh, and, uh, and give it to your brothers and come on home. Well, David got up there and David heard this uh, for 40 days, for 40 days, this big giant came and dared, dared Israel to choose a captain to fight him and we could just take care, uh, we can prevent the battle, <laughs> prevent the war, prevent many deaths. If I defeat your captain, said Goliath, then you be servants of, of, of the Philistines, and if uh, your captain defeats me, then I'll, uh, my country, Philistines, will be servants of Israel. So David comes up there, little David, a little fella, and David comes up and he hears Goliath. And David says in so many words, why doesn't somebody go knock his block off and shut that big mouth up? And uh, so uh, David's brothers, he said, son, now you go on back home. Then David said, well, I go back home. But said, well, I'm here. Why don't I take care of that big loudmouth fellow? 
And they said, Now look, sonny boy, wars are for men, not for boys. This is no place for a boy. You go home, take care of the sheep now, and do your job. And we men will fight the battle. Well, David said, You men say you'll fight the battle, but you're not fighting the battle. That big bladder mouth up there keeps threatening, and why don't somebody take care of him? And they, well, they said, well, 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 who could? And David said, let me have a shot at him. And they said, well, you couldn't handle him. Well, David said, look, I killed a lion uh, with my bare hands. I killed a bear with my bare hands. I bet you I'd take care of him. And so his brothers uh, uh, said, now, David, you can't do it. <laughs> Go on back. <laughs> and David said, wait a minute. He said, is there not a cause? I love that question. Is there not a cause? Nobody in this world's happy unless he has a cause. Nobody. Nobody. And so David said, his uncle, and so his brothers, and they took him to King Saul. And Ted said, King Saul, we got a mental case here. Said, uh, <coughs> little old <laughs> shepherd lad, <laughs> has come up here and says he wants to fight Goliath. And Saul, now Saul's the guy that should have fought him because the Bible says that Saul was bigger, the biggest person in Israel. He was bigger by his head and shoulders than any other person. He was head and shoulders above all of the people of Israel. So uh, the, uh, uh, Saul said, now, David, you want to fight him. And David said, you better know I want to fight him. And David said, I can take care of him. The Lord will be with me, and I can take care of him. And Saul said, okay, son. He said, then, if you're going to fight him, let me give you my armor. And David, a little bit of David, gets into Can you, can you imagine? Uh, let's see. Can you imagine uh, Eddie Lapina wearing Joe Boyd suits? I mean, uh, uh, it, David, David got inside that armor. <laughs> he walked a block and a half, and the armor didn't move. And uh, David said, let me take it off. And Saul said, now, wait a minute. He said, this is the armor. He said, you, this is my armor. <laughs> I used it. It's mine. Use it. And, uh, and David said, I cannot go with these. I cannot go with these, for I have not proved them. But David said, I got a slingshot here. I've proved it, boy. I'll guarantee you, I can knock the eyeball of a fly at a hundred yards. This is all in the Hebrew. You won't get this in the English. And I, since I'm a chancellor of a college, I'll have to go deep in the scriptures and teach you things you don't read in the English language. But David said, <laughs> I'll, I'll take care of him. And then David wasn't cocky. David knew that God was with him. And David could say with Paul, I can do all things through Christ which strengthen me. And uh, But our text tonight is that little line where David said, I cannot go with these, for I have not proven them. You know what's wrong with this nation? This nation is going against what we proved success, bring success. I mean, we proved it. We built the greatest nation on the face of this earth, never lost a war to that stupid skirmish in Vietnam. We lost our character, let a bunch of long-haired hippies scare the fire out of us. And uh, and change our whole uh, whole character of our country, and we proved it, Bobby. Listen, America is is so bent on on uh, on using things that aren't proved instead of going back to things this country has proved and other kingdoms have proved in years gone by. And herein lies the trouble with our country. We are gambling with what is unproved. You know. I like to find what I want and keep it. I like to find what works. You look at a man that wears one kind of shirt, only one kind. You give me any kind but that, and I'll give it away. I wear one kind, same brand. I wear an arrow shirt, Kirk Kent. Sometimes it's called Kirk. <coughs> Sometimes it's called Kent. Sometimes it's called Kirk Kent, and it's for Clark Kent. But anyway, I am. Um, but uh, I wear one kind of shirt. That's all. That's all. I uh, <laughs> I have uh, I have to wear a, a clean shirt every day, and I travel a lot. And usually, I'll when I travel, I, I wear two shirts a day, uh, not at the same time. But I wear two shirts a day, and uh, so uh, I uh, I wear one kind of shirt. I don't. Uh, you give me a Van Heusen, I won't wear it. Uh, you give me. I don't care what it is. I won't wear it. I wear a, 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 an era Kirk. Or sometimes it's called a Kirk Kent or Kent. It's all I wear. And uh, I wear, uh, if it's short sleeve, era Kirk, era Kent. A long sleeve, era Kirk, era Kent. That's what I wear. 
You say, why don't you try, why don't you look around and try to find something better? I like what I'm using. I proved it. I like it. I mean, I like the collars. I like the sleeves. I like the, the room in the middle. I, I just like it. I am. So uh, my son Dave gave me some Christian Dior shirts. I gave them away. I'm not going to wear them. Say, why? Why don't you try? Don't need to try them. Found what I want. I proved them. I wear the same kind of socks. I wear the socks that have that have on the top of them. I wear them sometimes on my feet, sometimes in my pocket here. And so, uh, same kind of socks. I wear the socks. Say, I'm a little bit colorblind. And so I found these socks. That if, 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 if they're navy blue, they have a trim at the top, a little trim that's uh, a light blue. Like you can see this down here at the front. Uh, uh, see that? It has a eat your heart out, and uh, it has a little uh, little uh, light blue trim. If it's a black sock, it has a red trim on top. If it's a uh, if it's a brown sock, it has a tan trim on top. And uh, I said, what do I wear? Now, no, no need to give me any others. I won't wear them. I don't care what you give me. You say, well, Brother Hunter, won't you try something else? I like what I got. I proved it. I like it. Don't want anything else. I, um, I, use a, I, use, I wear the same kind of underwear. Same kind. All the time. All the time. <laughs> and I, <laughs> I wear a... <laughs> I, I, I wear the same kind of T-shirt. I, I don't. I don't wear undershirts. I wear T-shirts. I don't want. I don't want the perspiration getting on my shirt. So I. I wear a T-shirt, and I wear the, uh, the jockey brand T-shirt. Always do. Always do. Large size, 42 to 44. That's all I ever wear. Don't buy me a 38 to 40. I won't wear it. Don't buy me an extra large. I won't wear it. Uh, I, I, and I won't buy. I won't wear a, a Hanes or. A <laughs> no way. <laughs> well, you say, preacher, you thought you'd try something else. Go on, try it. I found what I want. I proved it. I like it. In the first place, you keep your nose out of what kind of T-shirts I wear. I use the same kind of toothpaste all the time. All the time. Hey, I, I don't care how much fluoride they got in another brand. I use the same kind all the time. I don't care if it prevents more cavities. I'll just use what I got and have more cavities. I, uh... I like what I got, <laughs> and <laughs> all the time. <laughs> well, don't you try something? Go on, try anything else. Like what I got. I proved it. I like it. I, I use the same kind of hairspray all the time. I use ton sort hairspray. It's all I ever used. Don't get me any command. I don't want it. Don't get me any uh, um, other kind. I, uh, uh, no, I won't use real cream. I tried that. Women chase me all the time. <laughs> and no. Uh, <laughs> Uh, I know what I want. I want consort. I, 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 I've got just a few hairs up here. And I, I said the other night, I thank God. I thank God. He let me live in the dispensation of hairspray. I just take what few hairs i got. Each one has a place it's got to be. And I put it where it ought to be and shoot it with, uh, with uh, hairspray. I, I use the, uh, uh, <laughs> the uh, whole, extra whole kind. I mean, the kind that's got glue mixed in with it. I use it all the time. That's all I want. Will you see the hound? Who wants to try? I don't want to try. I don't want to. Well, shut up. Like what are you? Like what I got? I use the same kind of men's talcum. I use men's aftershave talcum. That's all I plan to use. No use shouldn't give me any more. Give me a set of, of a, old English. I won't use it. I use men's aftershave. Well, you say, why don't you change? Well, look at my face and see how pretty it is. You'll know why I don't change. That's all I use. All I ever use. Use it for years. I uh, <laughs> I use the same same kind of deodorant. I, I I do not. I don't remember how many years I've been using the same kind. I use the fresh deodorant, not the stick kind. The kind of little uh, what do you call it? Paste. Uh, what do you call that? Cream. Use a yellow yeah, cream. You know, <laughs> little flat to container. That's all. It's, it's called fresh. I, I won't use Ed. Say why? He does. <laughs> No way. <laughs> I won't use mom. Moffitt uses that. Doesn't work. Only I use fresh. 
fresh cream yogurt for you. And uh, you can buy me anything. Else. I won't use it. I won't use it. Why? Hey, brother, how? <laughs> won't you experiment? Don't need to experiment. Found what I want. Found what I like. I approved it. Oh, this old country. Listen, in all this little frivolity tonight, I'm teaching you a lesson you ought to learn. I I use the same kind of, of um, razor, Bronson Electric. I don't make them anymore. I found that they weren't going to. I bought me six of them. I got I got I got enough. I think I got enough to last me a lifetime. I bought me a bunch of extra heads and extra uh, little cutting edges, and that's all of you. <laughs> no, <laughs> I won't use a ruckle. <laughs> It won't work on me. It won't work. Morocco won't work on me. No, I, and I won't use a Remington or a double thing. No, I'm not going to do it. Now, you use what you want to use. I found what works on me. Uh, one of the greatest days in my life was when I got saved. Second greatest day when I discovered a Ronson razor. A shaver. I've got a, a very tender skin. Matches my heart. And uh, a tender skin. <laughs> and a tough beard. <laughs> I can shave one time with a John with a safety razor, and I have to call the medic, the uh, paramedics, uh, because I bleed to death almost. I, I, I just cut myself to pieces. And uh, I use a Ronson razor. Well, you say, won't you? I don't want to try it. Well, brother, have any recommendation? I don't want recommendation. I, I know what I want. I like it. I proved it. I'm not going to change. You say, you're stubborn. Yeah, I'm very happy to. I used to think I, I, I always wear uh, patent leather shoes. <laughs> Never buy a leather shoe. Patent, always patent leather. Why? So I shine them. Get a wash rag, wash the wall. That's all, that's all I wear. Patent leather shoes. <laughs> you say, well, how? <laughs> Leather's in style. The patent leather come back in style, so I'll stay where I am. They'll, come, they'll get around to me again. I, uh, <laughs> I use the same kind of foot powder every morning. I put Dr. Scholl's foot powder in my shoes. I always do. Every morning, Dr. Scholl's foot powder. I keep in, in, in the top of the dresser. <laughs> I keep some, some, uh, some, um, oh, my soul. What am I trying to say? Uh, little tablets, uh, uh, honey, uh, what do you call it? Huh? Bee pollen, yeah. I keep bee pollen. Every morning, I take a little bit of bee pollen. And every morning, always do. Uh, when I get to the office, I always take nine um, 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 alfalfa uh, tablets. That's wintertime. Summertime, I graze. <laughs> always do. Nine alfalfa tablets. That's always take them. Never change. Get to the office in the morning, take nine alfalfa tablets, two garlic, two garlic tablets. Always do. Take a one of these vitamin. <laughs> take a... A B complex. I take uh, uh, I take uh, vitamin E and <laughs> and <laughs> other. <laughs> always do. Not going to change. Uh, told Mr. Brown that I asked Mr. Brown, said, would you help, would you get me some some I need some uh, garlic capsules and she got me the wrong brand and I told her I said look get, get me the other brand quit quit experimenting. I, she got me some that had parsley in it. I wanted garlic and parsley. I just said get me some garlic and parsley. I wanted garlic and. Uh, so, uh, <laughs> yeah. so, why? What are you saying? <laughs> I'm saying that if you found something that you prove, there's no need to change. And this old country is going to hell because they're paying a bunch of people with tax money to go to our universities and schools and try to teach our people to try something new. When with the old, we built the greatest nation on the face of God's green earth. Herein lies the trouble of our country. We're gambling with what is unproved. We're doing it and rearing our kids. Most foolish, stupid thing this country's ever done. We listen to Mr. Spock, who said later on, <laughs> years ago, he said, I, I, I made some mistakes in, my, uh, in what I wrote in my book. Well, I could have told him years and years ago if he'd listened to me. We don't have to have, we don't need new books on how to rear children. Unless it just reminds us of the old ways to do it. I got a mighty good book on how to rear kids. It's always worked. Never has failed. A nation that's reared their kids on this book. And by the way, if your kids don't turn out right, don't you blame the school. The school's not supposed to rear your kids. You're supposed to rear your kids. 
Now, the school is supposed to undergird what you teach in the church is supposed to undergird. But somebody's got the idea that if the kids don't turn out right, change schools, change churches, we ought to change moms and dads. Homes turn out kids. Families turn out kids, moms turn out kids, and dads turn out kids. And if your kid doesn't turn out right, don't you point to the shoot director here. You look in the mirror. We don't need new methods, rearing kids. The Bible's got the answer. I like old Dr. Bill Rice. He used to have a sermon on how to rear kids. He said three things. Love them, lick them, and learn them. That's it. It's in the Bible. <laughs> <laughs> so, got a bunch of Dr. Messima and Dr. Big Britches getting on television, and we have Dr. So-and-so, this Ph.D. from Harvard and how to, in, in, in the rearing of children, he has a new method. Well, turn the stupid set off and send Dr. Messima back to Harvard, but they don't have any decent kids anyhow. And, uh, and open the Bible and find what the Bible says. Train up a child in the way he should go. When he's old, he'll not depart from it. And listen, we know what will work. It worked for years in this country. Well, let's say with David, I cannot go with these, <laughs> for I've not proved them. <laughs> We're doing the same thing in international affairs. We did real well with our nuclear freeze for years. We did real well without an arms treaty. And I have been so disappointed, Mr. Reagan, talking about arms treaties. Don't need that. Just build an army big enough, Air Force big enough, enough bombs. Say to Russia, we, we, we're not going to send any your way. But if you send any our way, we're going to send some your way, bigger than the ones that you sent our way. It's always worked. Worked in the Spanish-American War. Worked in the Monroe Doctrine. Worked in World War One, <laughs> worked in, a, in World War Two. <laughs> what is it? I mean, we just say we are going to defend our land. Let the Jane Fonders go to the devil. Let the dirty liberals holler and scream, and let the hippies spread their odor and their filth and their garbage. Let them do it. Let them chant and let them walk up in Washington and demonstrate all they want to. Let's just do what we prove is the way to save our nation. It's always been that way. I'm not bringing anything new. I'm just telling you, we prove the old way works. And anybody that says we ought to have a nuclear freeze or, or, or unilateral disarmament is either ignorant or is pink. And I don't think many of them are ignorant. We proved it. We we had a pretty good uh, system. You know what? Listen, <laughs> when when Germany attacked the Rhineland and Italy went to Finland and Hitler went to Czechoslovakia. And Japan <laughs> bombed Pearl Harbor. <laughs> Every red-blooded American male wanted to go and defend his country. And if you could not pass the physical, it broke your heart. We proved that it work. I've said it again and again and again. <laughs> he would have done one thing in Vietnam. <laughs> We'd just gone up and drawn a line and said, right here. There you go. Now we said, Tommies, you're not crossing that line. And if I should have said, what you going to do if I do? I said, I would, I did, I'm not going to say what I'm going to do. You're just not crossing that line. Well, but, but what it means you're going to take? Could be getting the conference table and discuss it. You can go to the conference table if you want to, but I, you're not crossing that line. When I came to the First Baptist Church of Hammond 24 years ago, uh, a few of the fellows wanted to run my preaching. I <laughs> said, could some of the deacons meet? Tomorrow night, have a meeting of the deacons. I said, yes, sir, sure. As on Monday night, Tuesday morning, one of them called me and said, where were you? I said, what do you mean? Well, he said, you said we could have a deacon meeting. I said, don't get me. I didn't say I'd come. No way, because we're not going to discuss my preaching in a deacon meeting. Nobody. 
I've been preaching for 37 years, 24 of those years right here behind this pulpit, and I've never discussed my preaching with any deacon yet, and I'm not going to start tonight or tomorrow. Why? Because I know what will work. And America doesn't need to sit down, Mr. and drop off. America just needs to say, you're not crossing that line. And listen, if we don't do something in El Salvador and quit listening to these pinkies, we're going to have Honduras, Nicaragua, El Salvador, and Mexico under the hands of Moscow. And brother, it is not El Salvador that's causing the trouble. It's Moscow causing the trouble. And if we don't do something about it, we're going to have communism next door. And brother, we're going to lose our freedom. We, we, we all, look, we, we don't want to do with communism. We've proved what to do. When I was in Canada preaching at the National Convention for the Evangelical Baptists of Canada in a big auditorium there in the city auditorium of, of uh, Hamilton, Ontario, checked in the room and turned on the television and this set, the news was on. <laughs> <laughs> it said, it said President, Kennedy, President Kennedy has said to Russia, get your missiles off Cuba. We're blockading Cuba. Did you get your missiles off the island of Cuba? <laughs> Cuba, we're blockaded, and you won't be able to come and go. And, brother, that's the last courageous deed, real courageous deed, any president of our nation has ever done in international matters. And what happened? Russia said, okay, okay. You, you, you know, never had explained so well. You heard the story about this fellow. I'm going to have to be black, brother. That was sad. He walked into a bank and he said to the banker, would you cash my check? And the banker said, he said, uh, no, sir, I can't do it. He said, unless you have identification, can you identify yourself? And this fellow said, uh, there you go. You're discriminating against my race. You want me to identify myself? He said, uh, I, I'll go somewhere else. He went down to the next bank. He said, would you cash my check? And the banker said, I'm pretty sure you can show identification. He said, there you go, too, discriminating against me. He goes down to the next bank. The teller was about six foot six inches tall, weighed about 275 pounds. This fellow said, would you cash my check? He said, if you'll, if you'll, uh, if, if you'll uh, give me identification and sign it, endorse it. He said, there you go. Want me to endorse it and identify like those other fellows did. He, I, he said, that's discrimination. This big old six foot six inch giant grabbed this guy with a collar and said, sign it, fella, sign it. He said, okay, okay. I just never had to explain so well before. <laughs> Mr. Kennedy pretty well explained to Russia, too. And Mr. Khrushchev said, never had to explain so well before. And they took the missiles off Cuba, and if America had any integrity, and would use the methods that have been proved, we wouldn't have any trouble in Cuba tonight, or in Honduras, or in Nicaragua, or in El Salvador. No problems. David said, I cannot go with these. <laughs> well, I've not proved it. <laughs> and that's why we can't go with nuclear freeze. We've not proved it. While uh, Mr. Chamberlain was making peace, he fought with the German Third Reich. The very minute he was making peace, they were attacking us in World War II was, was starting. Same things, what's wrong with our domestic safety? Well, how is you for gun control laws? I cannot go with these, but I've not proved them. It's been proved, brother, that America was a pretty good nation when we people were allowed to have guns in their houses. And I'll guarantee you one thing. Take the guns out of the houses of law-abiding citizens, but you won't get them out of the hands of crooks. You won't do it, and we'll be helpless and defenseless before, before dishonest, law-breaking people. I mean, why in the world, after 200 years of building America, the greatest nation this world has seen in the last 500 years, why in the world? But we go with what's proved and quit trying to experiment. I'm not going to come back next Sunday night. Next Sunday morning. I never have been preaching to get you to come back. I've been preaching to tell you the truth while you're here. And brother, let me tell you something. Our country's going to the devil tonight because we have not gone back to the proven things that have made this nation what it is. 
For the hounds, don't you think we'll outlaw capital punishment? I cannot go with these, for I have not proved them. We pretty well proved that capital punishment works. Oh, they say, yeah, but <laughs> we, uh, we have more murders than we used to have. Yeah, we've got about ten times many people we used to have, too. We had a pretty decent country one time. You couldn't buy a Playboy at every magazine or uh, rack. You couldn't buy a Playboy or a penthouse or hustler magazine at <coughs> airports and drug stores. You bought them between the covers of decent magazines hidden there because lustful people bought them uh, from people that were trying to make a buck. And this country was okay. We proved that a godly, godly country. We proved that a country could get along without liquor. We proved that prohibition. All oh, that you say, Brother Hyde, this speakeasy came up during prohibition. It's okay, buddy. It was still against the law, and it wasn't respectable. The average American <laughs> spends five dollars and twenty-five cents about a week on liquor, and I didn't spend nine last week, so you must have spent ten and a half. And these little self-styled experts have gone off to Yale, Harvard, Princeton, University to mess them up, and come back and said, "We have, we have a, we have a new plan." I'd like to remind you: the Bible says, "Seek the old paths." I'd like to remind you <laughs> that it's not been proved, <laughs> but there was an America until a few years ago. We, we, let, a, we let a bunch of fellows, that, that long-haired people, they, 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 they told us how to run a country when they hadn't even run a hot dog stand themselves. They changed this country. Why? Because our politicians got afraid of them. In sex education... All of a sudden, <laughs> little kids, 5th, 6th, 7th, and 8th grades will be taught sex by strangers. Let me just say a few words about this. In the first place, a kid in junior high school is not ready to talk sex yet. By anybody. I got, I got a few little guilty when our kids were about 16 or 17 when nobody ever taught them sex education. I went to John Rice, and I said, Dr. John, <coughs> when did you teach your girls about the facts of life? He said, when I heard they were going to get married. No business for the school. No business for Hammond Baptist High School teaching sex education. First place, when it's taught, mom and dad's forced to teach it. Not the business of the school to teach it. What you say, modern psychologists have said it's the best thing to do. Modern psychologists are going to hell, too. And I'm not cursing. I'm saying that's where they're going to go unless they believe this book. And they don't believe the book. They're wrecking a nation because they want something new. But I cannot go with these, for I have not proved them. But we have proved that this book is, is the answer. Proved it. It's been proved. So what have we done? <laughs> we listen <laughs> to the to the uh, Kinses and the Seekers people. And every one of you ought to get my little booklet on, on the sex education program and read it. We listen to them. What's happened? Right over here in the city of Chicago, one or more than one <laughs> half of the babies that are born in Chicago every year have no daddy. I dare you to go to some of these high-rise places. I just dare you. Go to some of these high-rise places and see how many apartments you've got to knock on the doors of before you find a man in the apartment. Just check it out. Some of you bus folks know what I'm talking about. <laughs> What's the result of these heathen that are trying to put sex education in our public school and done it? Why are you against it? I cannot go with these, for I have not proved them. Same thing is true in our churches. You know why we have preaching here every Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, Bible teaching? You know why I never move this pulpit off on Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, for a movie? You know why? 
because I cannot go with the movie. I have not proved it. But I have proved for over a third of a century that Bible preaching and Bible teaching is the answer. It's been proved. You know why I'm not too interested in in plays? Well, it'll be a it'll be a it'll be a cold day, an air conditioned day where the booger man lives before I shut down preaching here for a play. You say why? Well, the house you're behind time. No, I'm just not going to do what has not been proven. This country is built on preaching. This country will be salvaged on preaching. I'm not even going to change the time to 5.30 in the afternoon on Sunday night. We've done rather well. 7 o'clock for all these years. Proved it. We said, well, the house, we can get out earlier and go to McDonald's. Well, let's get out later and go to bed. I, I'm just not going to do it. I've come too far. <laughs> and I'm not, I'm not going to arrange the schedule of the church to fit the world. Let the world change her schedule to fit the church. I've proved it. It's been proved. Preaching's been proven. That's one reason why I use the King James Bible. Well, the house, why don't you use them? <laughs> A good news to modern man. First place, it's not good news, and it's modernism. I don't need Moffitt. Good speed. I don't know why you wrote that Bible now. <laughs> I don't belong to the Bible of the Month Club. I use King James Bible. <laughs> you say, why? Because it's been proved. Well, Brother Howes, you can understand so much better if you get one of these modern translations. You check the crowd that reads that modern stuff. And you just see how much Bible they know. I use King James. <coughs> Improve. Where? Oh, Mr. Moody did a pretty good job with it. Billy Sunday didn't do half bad. Billy Sunday was such handicapped. He didn't even have the revised perversion. Or the reverse standard. He didn't even have the new school for you. Or the new King James. He didn't have it. It's amazing how well he did without all these helps. The Bible I hold in my hand, right? Has <laughs> been proved. That's why I don't use one reason I don't use religious rock. Amazing grace has been proved. Old Rugged Cross has been proved. But Jesus bear the cross, the Lord's been proved. There's a fountain filled with blood's been proved. Tell Mother I'll be there. It's been proved. The great judgment morning, it's been proved. Blessed assurance has been proved. I mean, it's been, these great songs we use here have been proved in the greatest churches the world has ever known, in the greatest revival campaigns and evangelistic crusades the world has ever known. We don't need this little junky garbage religious rock that's a substitute for proven gospel music. We don't need it not been proved. I cannot go with these. If I have not proved. It's amazing how well Sam Jones got along with the King James Bible. Pilgrims did pretty well. Great churches have done rather well with it. Only reason I'm for these translations, it does keep a lot of theologians from bothering the rest of us if they're somewhere in a closet translating another Bible. It keeps them out of the schoolroom. I, folks, I just don't understand why all of a sudden things that are proved have to be second class. Unless you're theorizing, you're not educated anymore. Unless you're experimenting, <laughs> you're not the <laughs> scholarly anymore. One reason why <laughs> we just stick with soul winning. There's a pretty well known Presbyterian preacher down south that's come out with a new soul winning method. He said, I don't mention hell. And don't tell the folks they're sinners. You say, Well, how do you use that method? <laughs> no, why? 
I cannot go to these, for I have not proved them. I've been telling folks, I've been telling folks they're sinners for 37 years. I've been telling them they died to go to hell for 37 years. And I'm just going to keep on, I just, I've just come too far, turn back. No wonder he wears a gown. Well, how are you going to get with it and wear a robe? When, I, when they put me in a straight jacket? Can you imagine me in a robe? The time I got through one, one sermon, to see the britches be around my neck. So you're out of date. <laughs> yeah. And you're up to date and in trouble. Whatever happened to old-fashioned honor, that's been proved. How about integrity? <laughs> that's been proved. How about a heaven that has golden streets and a hell that has fire and a sin that's black and a salvation that can transform your life? That's been proved. I cannot go with these. Why? I have not proved. David said, they have a slingshot. That's all I need. But David, this, this is the best armor that they make, that the armory. David. This is the king's armor. You never had him like this. David said, boy, if I'd have had that when that lion came, I never could have licked him. He said, I made it okay. He said, you see these arms? And you see this sling? I protected my sheep on the back side of the desert. <coughs> I kept the serpent from them. I kept the lion from them. I kept the bear from them. <coughs> and David said, Somebody! I proved this. I know it'll work. You know, let me tell you what's been proved. Second Chronicles 7.14 has been proved. My people have called my name, will humble themselves and pray, seek my face and turn their wicked ways. Then will I hear heaven, forgive their sins and heal their land. That's been proved. And anybody's ever done it, in a nation's ever done it, God's healed the land. That works. It's been proved. You know, I was thinking last night, my old pastor when I was a kid named Brother McElroy, about the size of Joe Boy, about six foot three or four, and built about like Joe Boy, a big husky fellow. I used to worry myself sick about him. He used to stand up and he'd point his finger out there at our little church and he'd say, <coughs> he'd say, <coughs> we'd have one sinner. Usually we only had one sinner at the time come. He'd, he'd, he'd single shoot that fellow. Boy, I mean, that poor fellow, if any sinner came, Brother McElroy preached a whole sermon right to him. And I can see him now in the imitation. A sinner sitting back here, he'd go to an imitation. <laughs> Remember earlier? Yeah. But he, I, I heard he said, he said, <laughs> he, he said, you trust Jesus. He said, if you'll trust Jesus as your Savior. And he made a statement that scared the fire out of me. He said, if you trust him and he doesn't save you, I'll close my Bible and never preach another sermon as long as I'm in. And now when I saw folks walking down the aisle as a little boy, I'd say, Lord, save them now. I don't know if I preach it a good preaching. But brother, never has been a person who came to Christ and said, I'm a sinner. I'm lost. I know I'm lost. I know I'll, I deserve to go to hell. <laughs> But I realized that the virgin-born, sinless Son of God came and paid my penalty on the cross. And I trust Him as my Savior. Never has been a one that minute who didn't receive eternal life immediately. It's been proved. It's been proved. And you know what? A lot of folks every once in a while, they say, Preacher, <laughs> that preaching you do, that southern preaching. I got news for you. The kind of preaching that I'm doing right now started in the Northland. In this country, you just you go to Maine, brother. Old Elder Knapp, Charles G. Finney, other great men of God. <laughs> this old-fashioned hellfire and brimstone Bible preaching spread over New England and started in New England, and it was in the Illinois, Indiana, wherever it got to Texas. It just got there last, and liberalism got here first. Improved. 
There was a day when you couldn't find a Baptist preacher who didn't believe this book. And now you, I, I can take you to Baptist seminaries that will tell you this book is not true. And Baptist colleges. But I cannot go with them, for I have not proved them. I'll tell you what's been proved. Malachi 3.10 has been proved. Bring you all the tithes in the storehouse. Prove me now here with Seth the Lord holds. If I will open the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing that shall not be received, it has been proved. It has been proved. It has been proved <laughs> that the tithe, <laughs> that the 90% will buy more food than the 100% been proved. It's been proved that God's going to get the tithe. It's been proved. How do you what's been proved? Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things should be added unto you. It's been proved. It's all settled. You know, I don't, I don't like this new lingo. It's not a preacher will say, say, we're having a religious emphasis. What would you call it a revival? Say, how many commitments did you have? will not you call it? How many folks got saved? Say, now you need to give your commitment to Jesus. Won't you just say you got to get born again? It's been proved. It's been proved. By the way, I'm not preaching anything new. The reason some of you folks are all huffy and puffy is because you're not, you're not willing to take what's been proved. Because you went to some little cottage somewhere, the rest of the long-haired freaks. And a bunch of atheists sat there and taught you this book is a true. That crowd is ruining the nation, brother. We've got to get back to what has been proved. And this book has proved itself. It needs no proving. It's proved itself. How do you what's been proved? Psalm 1. Blessed is a man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the well of sinners, nor said to the seed of the scornful. But is that light is in the law of the Lord, in his law doth meditate day and night. He shall be like a tree planted with the river of waters that bringeth forth his fruit in his season, and leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. I guarantee you that's been proved. Psalm 126, 6, He that goeth forth and weepeth bearing precious seeds shall doubtless come again to draw sing, bring his she- sheep. That's been proved. Every once in a while some preacher get a pretty good sized church somewhere, start something new different. Folks will flock to it. You folks not have much fun, are you? Every time I see you frown, I add five minutes to the sermon. And I got some of you laugh, haven't laughed yet. And then that's where I reached your heart then. Yeah. Got new ways. We'll have we'll have we'll have Hey, <laughs> we'll have Bible studies in homes and cottages. We'll invite unsaved people there, and they'll study the Bible with us, and we'll sneak up on them and serve them hot chocolate and donuts and get them saved, and they won't even know about it. <laughs> house to house has been proved. I mean, knocking on doors has been proved. It's Bible, the Word of God has been proved. And I'm just going to go, listen, I'm 56 years old, but 57 my next birthday, and 58 the next one, and 59 the next one. I'm not going to tell you what will be the next one. But every, every time the, the wind blows from some little foul mouth preacher, I'm not going to change my direction. My heart's fixed. It's all set. It's all set. I shall not be, I shall not be moved. I shall not be, I shall not be moved just like a tree that's planted by the waters. I'm just not going to be moved. You can huff and puff, get mad and leave, I'll not be moved. I've already decided, I've already proved what I want. Don't you make me change my socks. On my feet or in the pocket. I like my shoes, I like my deodorant, I like my underwear, I like my shirt. I like my foot powder. I like my toothpaste. I like my Bible. And I like my soul in. And I like my prayer time. And I like my convictions. And I have, for these 36 plus years, I've been preaching. 
And brother, I cannot go with anything else, for they have not been proved. So if they could just stick to the old King James Bible I had all these years, I think they'll just stick to preaching the hell that's hot and the sin's black and the salvation that's real. I think they'll just keep on hollering against Hollywood. Screaming against smoking, drinking, dancing, cussing, rock music, and disco. I think they'll just keep on. I was in a church years ago. A little fellow walked up to me and said, Do you have a coffee shop ministry? I said, No, but I have a carrot juice ministry. I said, what's the coffee shop ministry? <coughs> he said, well, he said, he said you, you get your room and you build them somewhere and you paint it with psychedelic colors. And you get your guitars and you get some, you get some, <coughs> some make it look like a, a, a hippie place. But said, he said, it is for Jesus. And said, all these folks will come in there then. You sit around and pick on the guitar and use the same beat, but you put religious words to it. He said, oh, he said, that's the, I said, well, well, no, we don't have that. But he said, how do you expect to reach the young people if you don't have it? And I said, how many young folks do you have? Well, he said, last Sunday we had four I said, we had more in the restrooms than that. <laughs> Everybody here 19 and under, stand up right now, would you please? Everybody in this room, 19, come on, stand up, get up. All folks 19 and under. Well, while you're standing, I just want to remind you that as long as I'm here, we're going to still preach on against uh, preach on haircuts. We're going to still preach on women dressing like women and men dressing like men. We're going to still preach on uh, against rock music. Yeah. Why? Well, it's been proved. You see, it's been, it's been proved. It's been proved. Oh, said, I know some kids from the house won't agree with what you preach. You wait till the battle's all over. Oh! <laughs> School's going to pot, and the young folks are going to pot. Uh, it may seem like they're going to pot, but 56 out of 66 that walked across this platform the other day are going to Christian colleges. I shall not be, I shall not be moved. No way. No way. Oh, I've never made any pretense at all. I just believe the book like it is, believe in hell like the Bible says it. I believe heaven has golden streets, white's white, black's right, good right's right, wrong's wrong, good's good, bad's bad, uh, and I just think I'll just keep on. Okay. I say, what are you going to do if the church votes you out? I go across the street and start another one over across the street over there. Yeah, let you pussyfooters have first pussyfoot in church in heaven. Yeah. I cannot go with these. I've not proved them. I've not proved them. Nothing wrong with this country, except it couldn't be cured by our homes, our churches, and our schools, and our government going with what has been proved, instead of with some self-styled experts. Never have reared a kid that know how to rear kids. I mean, you'd be amazed how many folks going around this country talk, telling folks how to have happy marriages that are single. Listen, I'm not very smart, but I'm honest, and I'll guarantee one thing. You'll never hear me preaching on how to grow hair. I won't do it. I'm not qualified. Unless it's on how to grow two. I'm not qualified. I cannot go with these, said little David. I appreciate it, Mr. Saul. It's very nice of you, but said that's your armor, not mine. I've not proved it, but I've proved this slingshot. And I'm talking to some folks tonight with the hundreds. They've left the faith and the convictions you once had. You swallowed. <coughs> You, you little house, what's going on? Why is rock music going to change America? Oh, can you ask a question? Prove that it made America. Whether it's right or wrong is not the issue right now. It's not been proved it'll help a country. It's not been proved. 
I'll tell you what has been proved. I, Jesus, I love thee. I know thou art kind. That's been proved. Blessed assurance. Jesus is mine. That's been proved. On a hill, far away. That's been proved. There is a fountain filled with blood. That's been proved. At the cross, at the cross, where I first saw the light. That's been proved. That's been proved. Oh, love that will not let me go. That's been proved. This book has been proved. Listen. I want to play. There are dozens and dozens of people in this room tonight who are living a life of experiment. You're trusting your entire future and the future of your children and yet unborn children to a philosophy that has never been proved. And a heap of you tonight ought to get on your knees and say, Dear God, I'm sorry. This I cannot use anymore, for I have not proved it. Little David took those five stones. Put one in this lane. Mr. Goliath said, I can't believe what I see. So he raised up his lid there on his armor just to get a good look at that little boy. And all of a sudden, through that opening, there came an intruder. And Mr. Goliath never saw anything after that. And David went up and got his sword and chopped Mr. Goliath's head off and went down to the taxidermist. Had it embalmed. Went back to his family room. And put it up on the wall. Every time he walked by, this is stuff you won't get in English now. Every time he walked by and saw Goliath's head, he stuck his tongue out. And he said, one thing I can use there, buddy. I sure can use a slingshot. Not sure about Saul's armor. But this thing works. Because I proved it. And this thing works. It's, it's been proved. Father, bless the message to our hearts tonight. And call some people back.